Hey, this is James Arnold Taylor, voice actor, the voice of Yeah, but dabba do, Fred Flintstone. Johnny Test, who's 11 years old and totally awesome. Ratchet from Ratchet and Clank. Titus from Final Fantasy X. Oh, yes. And of course, Obi Wan Kenobi. It wouldn't be coffee with Kenobi without yours truly. The force is strong here indeed. This is Ashley Eckstein, Ahsoka Tano from Star Wars The Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan V. Well, joining us today for a cup of coffee, we've got quite a treat. We have an author extraordinaire. Not only is he a Star Wars author, but if you like great stories, you've probably read something from our esteemed guest, Kevin Scott. Kevin, welcome back to Coffee with Kenobi. Hi, Dan. Good to see you. You too, pal. Last time we chatted in person was at Celebration, and we said, you know what? We've got to make this happen again. So I'm, we have, I'm thrilled. And, and here we are. Here we are. We are manifesting. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so uh, before we even get into Star Wars, I would love to know more about your individual hero's journey. How did you first develop a love for the written word, and how did that evolve over time? Um, well, it's, it's what we would now call fan fiction. Um, so it was back in the <laughs> late eighties, nineties, um, when I used to send off the printed fanzines of various different fandoms, including Star Wars and Doctor Who and things like that. Um, and I used to write these awful little bits of fan fiction and send them off and submit them and God knows they're, they're out there somewhere, um, you know, and so, and that's, that's where it started really. And I, I, I started, that gave me the bug. I started seeing my name in print. I started to see fiction and articles and nonfiction articles being printed. Um, and I thought, oh, I like this. Um, I want to keep going. And so, yeah, it was a, a gradual move from there. And I mean, my work on fanzines led to me becoming a pro um, writer in, 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 as a journalist, a, a magazine editor. So yeah, it was, um, it was way back then with um, yeah, writing my own versions of Doctor Who and Star Wars, which I, I still am, which is amazing. Isn't that delightful? And it, I, I had Dan Slott on, uh, the great comic artist or yeah. writer, Dan Slott on uh, recently, and I told him, and I still am afraid to have to admit this, I still have not seen any Doctor Who. Not on purpose, I just haven't. I well, need I'm to, gonna, I know. I'm, we basically need to cut this interview now, and you need to go and watch, because tomorrow's the 60th anniversary of Doctor Who, you know, 60 oh, wow. years of the TV program. So um, you've got a lot to catch up on, let's put it that way. There's a, you'll be able to fill your Thanksgiving. Easily. It sounds like it. Now, do you have a place I should start? Oh, do you know, it's a really tough question because uh, the show is built on change. I mean, literally, the whole point of the main character being able to regenerate and change at a cellular level. Um, I would suggest going back to the 2005 reboot um, and starting there with Christopher Buxton in the role because it's modern enough, even though it's nearly, you know, 18 years ago now, um, it's modern enough to sort of be television you'd recognize. Um, and, and it's a, what they did when they brought it back was they, they stripped off a lot of the, a, a lot of the um, backstory. It was still there, but they didn't mention it. Um, and they, so they sort of dripped it in over the next couple of years. So it's a really good way of being introduced into the, what's now known as the Hooniverse. Um, hmm. And then you can start going back to the old series, which again is very different to the new series. I mean, I don't, I don't like that old and new thing. For me, it's all one series, it's all Doctor Who, but it's, it's definitely, there's definitely a century jump, you know, because you've got very modern TV um, from the new, the new iteration. You go back into, you know, the, the older series, that's British TV from the 80s, 70s and 60s. So it's a different pace. It's a different, um, you know, definitely a different budget. Let's put it that way. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, I think that what they did when they brought out the um, new series was a genius because it, it did introduce an entire new generation, literally, to, to the Doctor. And um, yeah, there's a, a lot to delve into. But from what I can gather, and I don't know much about it, the anniversary special starring David Tennant, which... Um, broadcast tomorrow seems to be a good jumping on point as well that sounds well i really that's like a little quick little master class on dr thank you I, 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 i'm no gonna worries. check it out i will let you know uh what i think okay. so we're talking about ips and of course you've mm -hmm. written original content ips you're mm -hmm. I, I particularly love your transformers stuff and i mean there's just right. you've got and so many great things but what is your writing process like for an ip versus original content 
Well, there's not much difference in the in the in the story creation. You know, it's it's, it's a story is a story is a story. I suppose today I've been writing the first part of a new original comic which um, I've originated, and the difference in that is I haven't had to have such a, de a dedicated outline because obviously when you're working with a licensed um, brand, whatever it is, whether it's Star Wars, whether it's Doctor Who, whether it's Transformers or, or whatever. You obviously have to get the storyline approved before you can start. So there are there is meticulous outlining that goes on, and that outline can have a lot of iterations. Now I do have an outline for this new comic that I started today, um, because it's impossible to write a comic without an outline because it's such a a, a strict format. However, my, it, it, no one else has to see that outline but me. So it's like some pages are like violence, cry. <laughs> it's like things like that so i know the emotional beat or the uh, the action beat that has to happen on that page i haven't got said and such and such does this and they say that and you know like you would for like the high republic for example mm -hmm. um my outlines for the high republic are you know far more detailed on a page-to-page -page level um because mike seglain has to see it because the story group has to see it because so you know, marvel has to see it um yeah so when you're writing something for you largely especially if it's the beginning of something um your notes beforehand could be far more fluid as you you um, experience but i i am an outliner because i've been doing license work for so long it's like 23 years now that, that i can't get out of outlining um you know totally i have to have some kind of plan there i, I you know i i'm actually working on my second master's degree right now in hmm. creative writing uh, so I, it's, I appreciate that insight because, you know, there are so many schools of thought. Some people dive in, some people make very, very detailed outlines. Uh, I, I imagine it's, it's quite a learning process to kind of find your feet. Yeah, exactly. And I think once, cause I'm in the slightly odd situation is that I did IP before original. It usually happens the other way around, but I was very fortunate and it was to do with Dr. Who, um, during the wilderness years because the two the two sorry to go back to who this isn't going to be a conversation about doctor who i promise no but the two fandoms of star wars and doctor who are so similar there was a series um then there was nothing for 16 years and during that time there were books there were comics there was audio dramas they were the fans were becoming the creators and stepping up um and then we got a new series in the same way uh, with star wars there was obviously periods fallow periods where the books and the comics kept the story going. And during Doctor Who's wilderness years, that's why I got my break in um, writing Doctor Who dramas, audio dramas, because at that point, um, it was much easier to break into because the, the BBC thought it was a dead brand. You know, they thought no one would ever want to make it again. So they were giving out licenses to people. And I pitched one of those. Um, so whereas most people come into IP by writing original and then moving over um, to IP work or incorporating IP work, I've got sort of gone the other way. And it, it, when I started to write my own material, not having any of those guardrails that you have with IP was A, liberating, yes, but also absolutely terrifying because I was waiting for someone to tell me no or waiting for someone to explain why I couldn't do that or to give me guidelines of what, you know, the story should be. And then you suddenly realise, well, no, it's literally just me. That's, um, that's terrifying. Um, and obviously, you know, starting from scratch, and, and you know, when you write for an IP, there is a there's a benchmark there, there's a, a blueprint. Um, when you're writing from something from scratch, you, yeah, you are you are the blueprint. So that was um, that was those were lessons I had to learn very quickly when I started to move, move to my original stuff. I love that, and it probably it's probably it's a little bit uh, it's it's kind of empowering in a way. And speaking of that. Obviously, uh, I think to be a good writer, you have to read good writing. So who mm. are some of the writers over time that have inspired you and what it is about them that act as a muse? Well, to keep the Who thing going, there was a, a writer called Terence Dix, who was the script editor um, on the show in the 70s and 80s, no, 70s really. Um, and he novelized the vast majority of the shows because obviously this is pre video. So the only way of getting older stories is they used to do little novelizations, what we call chapter books now. 
Um, and they were really got me got me reading when I was a kid. It was all I all I would read other than comics was Doctor Who novelizations because you could read them in a weekend. Um, and he was so good at succinct prose and driving the story forward, and also fixing the stories that were on TV. Sometimes he'd find ways, you know. And and I used to compare what I knew about the shows when I finally got to see them with the with these target novelizations that were called. So Terence Dix was one of my earliest ones. Um, moving on, Stephen King, I mean, he's the master. He's the master mm -hmm. of everything. And it's such a, it's almost like a, a boring answer. It's like, yes, Stephen King, one of the most successful novelists of the, of the last 100 years. But there's a reason he's successful. And the books of his that I love most are the ones that set up characters that only to destroy them five minutes later. I mean, things like Salem's Lot, um, The Shining is still a work of absolute staggering genius. And the fact you care so much about, about that father as he comes apart. Um, so yeah, King, King is up there, Gaiman, because of the love of folklore, which I share. Um, and there's a lot of the stuff with Neil Gaiman I see, because he's also a Brit and he seems to come from the same cultural background as me in the fact the things he loves i mean doctor who is another one sorry i will promise that might be the last time i mention it um the things like you know there's the sense of narnia in his work there's mm. the, the sense of arthur in his work there's there's a very british sherlock holmes-esque world there slightly slightly skewed childhood childhood adventures which is a very british thing um, and then to see him straddle America as well and to straddle different media. I think one of the things I love about my career and I feel very blessed with about is the fact that I get to write different media. I get to write TV, books, comics, audio. Um, and part of the reason I wanted to do it that is because I, I've watched Gaiman do it um, mm. and to see that someone can do that and still maintain who they are, no matter what the media. So, yeah, he's he's there, um, and through him, there's a lot of the the classics as well. Um, the classic British writers, Dickens. It's a, a complete. My, my favorite book is The Christmas Carol, um, mm. which is a good time for it this time of year. But I read um, it every I read it every year, and I teach it every December. It's, it's yeah. I think it's underrated as a as a work of prose. It's it's beautiful. It's beautiful and it makes me cry every time. I was at the Old Vic in London um, watching um, Christopher Eccleston again to mention another name, uh, the name we mentioned earlier, um, playing Scrooge um, in their, their annual production they've done since 2017. Um, and again, yeah, I cried. It was really powerful. It's still such a powerful novel. Um, and one of my future Star Wars projects that I can't speak about is definitely influenced in part by Christmas Carol. Wonderful. Well, in, in the people you're mentioning, I mean, uh, Charles Dickens, I was actually talking about this last week with someone, because uh, I mentioned Twain, he's my absolute favorite. Mm. But uh, on Mark Twain's first date with his future wife, he went and heard Charles Dickens speak, mm. and, which is beautiful. And Charles Dickens, he knows character, like I think anyone in the history of, of language, and he is just a master. But you also mentioned another master. I'm not surprised you mentioned Stephen King. He's great. And when it comes to horror, I think of you every Halloween because I know how much you love it. So what makes a good spooky story? And when is it too much or too scary? So I'm not, I'm not too hot on gore for gore's sake. I love a slasher movie as much as The Next Man. Mm -hmm. Probably more The Next Man's George Man because he can't stand up. But... <laughs> um, but that's one kind of horror, and it's not a scary kind of horror to me. To me, a scary horror is something going after your soul and changing who you are. Um, and so for me, that's, that's true scare, scares. That's true horror. The, the, the fact that someone changed... I, mean, I mentioned The Shining earlier on, and again, while I love the film, the book is far, far superior, because you, in the film, he's mad from the moment we meet him. I mean, you know, and, and there's loads of things that they they do in that film. In the fact that when you see him going to the interview, he's reading a porn mag. You know, it's like things that you don't even notice. Uh, you know, on a subliminal um, subliminal moment that puts you on edge. 
Um, but in the book, he is someone who's trying his best to be human um, and to be a dad again after going too far the other way. Um, and to watch him break down is, is terrifying. And I think that, like all good horror stories, makes you think, God, what if that happened to me? And to fear what would happen to your loved ones if you were in that situation. So for me, that's the, the scary, the scary thing. I mean, I, I also like, I like my stories to be, have a little bit of whimsy to them. I, I like them to have a little bit of silliness to them at times. But if I'm, if it's a, a scare that I'm after, I'm looking for something that will have the, yeah, the human condition altered. Um, and maybe the person knowing that it's coming, but can't, not being able to do anything about it. Oh, I love that. The idea of when it, when it's more personal, it's a better mm. scary story okay, because if you're not invested in the characters, then it's, it's honestly not as scary besides the initial jump. And then you just move on. I think that's why Halloween was successful because people cared about, uh, Laurie Strode. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I think, cause one of my definitions of a horror story opposed to like a thriller is that a horror story shows competent people who are un unable to change the future. Um, and you, you always have to have hope in a horror story because you want the characters to survive. And the horror could be that they don't. Um, so, yeah, there's got to be confidence in a good horror story from the character's point of view. They can't just do stupid things for stupid reasons. Um, and there has to be that hope that they will get out. And then largely that hope is squashed <laughs> at various points. I mean, I do love a bleak, dark ending. I mean, a couple of the films I've watched recently... The Empty Man, um, which I'd not seen, and, Ch and Charles Scott Soule had been banging on to me, watch this film, watch this film, and it was on, I saw it on Disney Plus, and so I, I watched it the other day. Um, and then um, talked to me as well, because again, it's that thing of, it's really unsettling. It's like um, people thinking they are, well, are one way and then find out they're other, and there's, once they're on that train, they can't get off. Um, yeah, th th those are the things that appeal to me. I love that. Well, well let's, let's be more specific uh, on some of your work. Tales from the Death Star is a wonderful collaboration of the world of Star Wars and Halloween slash horror. Talk about the balance between these two genres and what was particularly fun about this book. Well, um, so Tales from the Death Star was the, I think uh, I've been doing them since 2018, these sort of um, Treehouse of Terror, Star Wars graphic mm -hmm. novels and miniseries, where Lucasfilm have, has shown me so much freedom in the fact that I could retell tropes and types of story. I mean, like the one I always quote is the fact they let me rewrite the Wicker Man with Ewoks for the first tales of tales um, from Vader's Castle. Um, with Death Star, it was probably the last time, and it probably is the last time I'm doing that format for the Halloween special, because there are only so many times you can play these tricks, um, and so. I wanted to take it, I knew from the, from the beginning, um, I wanted to take it to the Death Star. And for the first time, I wanted all the stories to be about the Death Star. Because usually there's a framing device. The previous year was Jabba's palace and a, and a poor unfortunate hanging over the rancor pit and desperately trying to tell stories to entertain Jabba so he, Jabba forgets to drop him into the rancor's jaws. Um, this one, I wanted it to be actually about the Death Star. Um, and to have fun on Death Star, you know, there are, there are zombie stories in the book, there are monster stories in the book, there is a, 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 a ghost stories with incredible art by Ingo. Um, but yeah, I wanted it all to be about that place. Um, so that was why this one's special for me. The, the second thing about these books is pushing it a bit, because they are, they are all ages books. You know, they're supposed to be books that people can read together with their kids. Um, they're not necessarily child childish books or children's comics but i mean we really did come down on the idea of all ages so you know you can read this it's not going to be anything that will absolutely scar younger readers but some of it could be a little bit edgy because again i grew up in the 70s and the 80s in britain which seemed to just exist to terrify kids you know, the tv programs we had at the time were all there to sear things into your memory so you have nightmares about them for, for years to come. I, whenever I work on something with American um, editors, I show them some of the books that we had in the late 70s in the UK, and they can't quite believe that those are kids' books. You know, and, and it did happen at the same time in the States as well. You think of story, you know, story scare and that kind of thing. But, um, yeah, so it's a, it's a case of pushing how far we can push things 
with it without it becoming gratuitous and without being irresponsible with the with the fear and the horror mm. because you don't want to scar kids really but right. at the same time ki kids on the whole like being scared by by stories um because it's i think there's a part of it it's it's training wheels you know you, you, if you can be scared as a kid by you know whether it's an ogre an ogre in lord of the rings or you know or a, a monster in in star wars um, it's training um, wheels when, for when in life you might have to face fear properly. Right. Um, and you can learn a lot at a very early age in a very safe way through good children's horror. That's beautiful. Uh, you know, it, it makes it me more at peace with when I watched Jaws for the first time, which still is an absolute Stone Cold masterpiece. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Most of when people ask me about that, you know, writing horror for kids, I say, well, most kids, to be fair, have probably seen things that they shouldn't have seen by this point. You know, they've watched mm -hmm. horror films that they shouldn't have seen at that point in their lives. And that's part of the fun of being a horror fan. My daughter, who's 15, has now just started to embrace horror films. You know, she, she it happened, I think, last Halloween um, from last year, and she was 14 when she came back from a party to say, and she's watched Halloween. And I have never been more proud, you know. Yes, um, I get and it. then a couple of weeks ago, she came in. And I watched The Conjuring yesterday, and my wife nearly fell off the chair. And I was like, "Oh, the fun we are going to have!" Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, so I'm seeing it with her as well. And I was exactly the same way with a kid. You know, as soon as I started to get into monsters and scary stuff, and graduated, I graduated from Hammer and, and Universal as quickly as I could, while still loving those things. And I read James Herbert and Stephen King far, you know, found them in libraries. Shouldn't, you know, there was, I, I don't know our school library. I don't know if you're aware of the writer, James Herbert, who's a British horror writer. He's, he's, a, he's very much of a Stephen King-esque, hmm. I would say. With love in my heart, he's not Stephen King. You know, he's not as mas masterful as Stephen King, but he, he wrote a very particular and very well crafted type of horror book in the 80s and 70s. And for some reason, our school library had things like the rats and the fog and all those things in there, which I'm sure they shouldn't have done. But someone had put them in there, and I used to sit up there, scurry up there, and read as much as I could. So I know kids will be doing that. So I think it's, again, a way of of making sure that there is also something they could read, you know, read with, with their parents being absolutely appalled <laughs> that they're reading Stephen <laughs> King and the like. Um, but we all sort of know it's happening anyway. Oh, I had Jim Butcher on recently, uh, who's just a great yeah. author too. And and he recommended to me, he, he said, I love Stephen King, but I think Dean Koontz is uh, a yeah. different level. Yeah. I never read I mean, anything by Dean Koontz. Yeah, I mean, it's been a while since I've read some, but again, it's a, it, that, of the same generation, but they go in different ways. And that's how I feel about Herbert as well, you know, of the same generation or as, as King, um, similar in a lot of ways, but again, probably a little bit more British um because mm. he you know he was a brit um so yeah all that generation of writers there was a, a lot of um grady hendrix has written a great book called paperback from hell which was about the horror boom of the 80s um oh. uh, it's, it's really really good it's a, a great examination of that entire genre of things like um i think it's guy smith who did the crabs and you know and those kind of things um and it's it shows how horror has changed over the years um and and yeah, I think book horrors changed in a lot of ways. But then you have people um, like Chuck Wendig, who is, to, in my mind, the the guy who's taken Stephen King's crown and will do. I mean, there was a his latest book when I got the arc through it said from the master of horror, and I was like, well, that's a big claim. But but when I read his latest book, uh, Black Orchard River, yep, he's definitely take, you know he, he's the one standing. I think who will be seen as the next king while also being very much chuck and doing what wow. chuck wants to write um so yeah it's um it's i think it's good to see those foundations and how they're changing um in the current batch of writers that we've got coming through oh what a, what a wonderful endorsement you have given me so many things to add to my reading list <laughs> and speaking of reading lists, we've got a brand new phase of the high republic it came out november 8th mm -hmm. Uh, what can you share? Of course, uh, George Mann takes the 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 bull by the horns for this one. It's a, a, another fabulous, uh, exciting, frightening, 
a novel from the High Republic. What can you share about the series without giving us spoilers, of course, to help build the hype? Yeah, sure. So the series Phase 3 is back in the era that we first introduced way back in 2020, um, one, wherever it was. It seems like an eternity ago now. Mm -hmm. um, um, so we're back with Keith Trennis, who, um, who was the character we introduced there. We saw her become a knight, a Jedi knight. We saw her worry about whether she was ready. We saw her worry about whether she could stand up against, stand, stand up against, stand with sort of mighty Jedi um, and whether she had a place at that table. Um, we now rejoin the story after the Jedi have suffered a major, major defeat. Um, and the Jedi have pivoted, as we've seen in Chao Sol's Shadows uh, of, of Starlight. And they've accelerated a lot of the, the careers, if you want to put it that way, of, of mm. the Jedi. So a lot of the, the Padawans have been knighted. And, and Keeve has found herself in a position because of where she was when that tragedy happened at the end of phase one. She's found herself promoted to master um, and perhaps not in the way she would want to be. You know, I think it's something she saw in her future. Um, she didn't feel that she was ready for, but feels she had to take it when it was offered to her in the same way that we saw in the Clone Wars where, where the, um, the Jedi have to step up and step into shoes that they didn't necessarily want to fill. So what we deal with is Keeve trying to be um, the people she respected. Um, and I think that's the same across the entire phase. We, we've, we're seeing that in George's novel, you've got Elza Man trying to be Stellan Gias in a lot of ways. Um, and this, this story in the comic is Keeve trying to be Avar Chris. And for anyone who read the comic back in the original run knows how well that went for Avar Chris. Yes. So Keeve's, Keeve's story is going to be very different. Her path is going to be very different but that's always going to be there in the back of her head um, as she faces old antagonists and new friends and also old antagonists who might become new friends, we don't know, um, and tries to find her place in this, this shifting world that she's in when nothing was what she, she thought it was going to be. And definitely being a Jedi isn't what she thought it was going to be. Hmm. So that so that's interesting. You you're you're you've opened up a lot of doors for me. But I I'm going to take a quick uh, little sidestep, and I'm going to ask you. And you mm -hmm. sort of addressed this earlier, but when you're writing a novel, mm -hmm. it's very different from writing a comic book. What are some challenges for you about each medium? I'm sure it's a bit of a different mindset, perhaps. A challenge for me, personally, from a workflow point of view is that novels are daunting in a way that comics aren't. Because comics are very quick. Um, you know, they're fast paced, especially the kind of comics I'm writing at the minute. They're literally fast paced with some of the action. Um, but by it, because, I mean, the, the story of the High Republic ongoing, I mean, it's an ongoing comic, so it's months and months, and years and years ahead of us. Um, but it's broken down into very, you know, manageable pieces. You know, I know that every three weeks I have to write another 20 pages of this comic. Um, and I know what those steps are. Obviously with a novel, and this sounds really obvious, but it, it does make a massive difference. When you start in a novel, that's a load of work ahead of you. And mm -hmm. the story is, perhaps the story is actually no bigger than the comic you're writing, but it's, it's, concentrated in this a massive amount of work you've got to do so for me personally i have to then break it down into smaller chunks i mean that is can be as simple as the chapters or you know the progression of the characters but from a mindset point of view i have to break it down to if i sit down i've got to write a ninety thousand word a hundred thousand word novel i will never start if i have to think that so i have to break it down into how many words i have to write this month, this week, this day, this morning, this hour, because otherwise I will, yeah, I will be frozen by the sheer scale of what's had. Um, and then once it's going, it's, it's usually, I'm writing an original novel at the minute. I've, I've put it by away side for a couple of months because I, I've hit sort of 30,000 words in. I've hit a point where I'm going, no, I'm not sure. And I will go back to it. Um, but it wasn't working how I wanted to work. And again, it was, it's a case of going back in and trying to work out 
a granular, granular level, a smaller level, what, what are the problems? Because otherwise it just seems too big a task to sort of really look at that as, a, as one big story. So for me, it's always about breaking down. And on days when I'm struggling to write, um, the guy I mentioned earlier on, Terence Dix, I said I was not going to mention Doctor Who again. I am. I lied. Um, Terence <laughs> Dix, who wrote all those novels, I mean, hundreds of Doctor Who novels that I read as a kid. Um, after he passed away a couple of years ago, there was a documentary, and they showed the inside of his, his um, study for the first time, um, which was just teetering with books and videos and things. And he'd printed motivational comments through himself um, and put them on his notice board in front of him. And this is a man who literally has written hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of books, who script edited hours of television. And the one note he had up there was, don't let a late start become a no start. Um, and that's something I've really tried to take on board since seeing that. So even if I, I set myself a goal every day to try and get leave it a little bit on whatever that story is, um, and I try to at least write something. And that's actually whatever the, the medium. And usually, if I don't feel I can write that day and I start and I say, I'm just going to write 100 words, that 100 words will become 400. And that 400 words might become 1,000 words. Because once you're into it, that's when the, mo you know, the, the momentum keeps going. So, so yeah, again, when it's such a big thing like a novel, it's that thing of, I'm going to just do something today that's going to push it on. Um, otherwise, your late start becomes a no start so easily. Um, so yeah, mm. that's definitely that's definitely something I try and keep um, in the in the front of my mind. I, I very much appreciate that. I, I tell my students because I teach a composition classes and I teach some uh, mythology courses. And what I tell students is, look, even if you're not sure and you're stuck, as I always hear, well, I really don't know how to start my introduction for for an academic research paper, for example. And I say, look, here's what you should do. Get some words on the screen. Just get some words on because you can fix later. Uh, you know, otherwise you're, you're going to become massively intimidated, and then they get into their groove. It's interesting for me when I first started writing things, whether it's for something for DK and Disney or just grad school stuff or just stuff for coffee with Kenobi. I used mm -hmm. to want it completely silent, and now I I used to think, well, I can't listen to music because I'll if it's a soundtrack. I'll picture Indiana Jones getting the Chachaputin idol and I won't focus. Yeah. Or if I listen to White Christmas, I'll think about how great Bing Crosby's voice is. But then something switched in my brain and I thought, no, background music is actually a wonderful way to do that. Do you find music helps you? It, it depends. I, I've been listening to it more while writing recently. I used to write in silence too. Um, or to write with the sound of rain against windows playing on loop. Um, just so there's something there. And where you're interviewing me today, I have a, I have my studio at home, but then I have a space in, in town in Bristol where I live, where I come down for one day a week just to get out of the house and be somewhere. It's an amazing 17th century pub in the middle of Bristol where I'm sitting here in this library. Wordsworth stayed here and wrote. Wow. wow. I know. Mary Shelley stayed here when it was uh, oh my you know, gosh. With her husband, so it's an amazing place to work, but it's full of people. So I quite often have to have noise just to keep me focused. Um, I quite often use music while I'm um, plotting, and so that's um, because then that helps me get in the mood. And, and I have I have certain soundtracks that um, the Hellboy Two soundtrack, Danny Elfman's soundtrack, I have listened to it so much in that general kind of like fancy, quirky, fancy type that I no longer associate it with Hellboy. It's just how my, my brain goes click and it's like mm. I'm in that mood. The Alien, the Aliens soundtrack, which is, if people know their movies, also knows know that the Alien soundtrack is the Wrath of Khan soundtrack because he just reused it. Um, I use that. Yeah, yeah. There are, you listen to the Alien soundtrack and you will see Starfleet officers in your mind's eye running down because he literally had no time, so he just reused elements and then got Amazing. an Academy Award for it. Um, so I use that one when I want that kind of aliens type vibe. Um, and so in my head, they've become, they have become separated from mm. the movies that they are um, from. They have become just a 
palate cleanser or, or, or it put me in the right gear for the right kind of, me, of story. Can't listen to words, can't listen to lyrics. Um, I've started to, today, I, need, I was in the office, needed to write this comic I was starting. So because of the type of genre it is, um, I found some Latin American um, songs, which because I because I, I don't speak Spanish, I've got no idea what they're saying. So actually, it becomes like music in the back of my head. As soon as, as, soon as the lyrics I understand, I'm, I'm lost, I'm gone. Um, but yeah, so it's, music is for me a way of setting the mood. And yeah, there are lo I have a vast collection of soundtracks, which my wife's eyebrows raise every time a new record shaped box arrives. Um, <laughs> and so yeah, I, I usually pull something, not necessarily, you know, I, I, I do listen to Williams when I'm writing Star Wars. Of course, I do or planning Star Wars, but I don't necessarily always do that because actually, you you want to have the genre within Star Wars as well as the you know the Star Wars film. So um, yeah, music is incredibly important to me in the planning and the and the mood sense. I love that. Thank thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of the Oscar Pearson trio because they're just simple, mm. beautiful jazz. Well, nothing simple about it, but just beautiful jazz sets the mood. But you've you've got not only, of course, your Star Wars and your Doctor Who, and, but you've also got some wonderful original work. Uh, there's so much to celebrate, especially with Dead Seas, for example, published by IDW. Talk about mm. that four-issue book and the evolution of that. So Dead Seas um, it began with Star Wars because... Um, Nick Brokenshaw, the artist and the co-creator of Dead Seas. Um, I worked with him first on Star Wars Adventures. Um, he's another he's another Brit. Um, so he has a lot of the same sensibilities um, as me. He was brought up on things like 2000 AD um, and, the, and the artists that were in 2000 AD, which is a weekly science fiction, fantasy, horror comic in the UK, which has been running for years and years and years and where Judge Dredd comes from originally. Um, so we worked together. I think we... Before we actually worked together on Star Wars, we were just in the same issue of Star Wars Adventures because they used to have a backup strip and a main strip. And I think I was writing the main strip and Nick was drawing and writing the, the backup. And so by just being in the same issue, we sort of like bumped into each other on socials. Um, and then we met properly at Chicago, Celebration Chicago, um, in a bar, as these things always start. Um, and we started, yeah throwing ideas around um, and, and without even knowing we were throwing ideas around, just talking about the kinds of stories we loved, um, but Star Wars and otherwise. And we then went on to work together on things like Tales of Invaders Castle. Um, but I went to him and said, look, this is, this is working. This is, we, we're coming from the same place here. We should think about doing some original stuff as well. Um, and I'd had this idea, um, original ghost ship about, a, b a bunch of prisoners on a, on a prison ship. Um, and it basically, it's Poseidon Adventure, adventure meets um, Haunting of Hill House. That's why I sold it originally. Um, I, I love disaster movies from the 1970s. The idea of a prison ship where a disaster movie is happening. Yeah, absolutely. You add ghosts into it and you have a bit of fun because if people drown when the ship's going down, they come back as a ghost immediately. So I sort of pitched this to him and he started drawing these weird and wonderful ghosts. Nothing that I'd given him at this point had any, you know, any inspiration of the fact that he just started drawing bizarre ghosts with like horses, people with horses' heads and their guts hanging out and all these just kind of weird and wonderful. And, he, and I sort of said, what? these are amazing what is it and he was like i don't know yet but i think it's the something to do with the way they died or how what how their mind was when they died and so we just started building the story about these prisoners who um are on a ship and again it's 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 ludicrous and it's very 2008 they're scraping ectoplasm off the walls of this haunted ship because in this world ectoplasm is found to be a, a miracle cure um you know it can keep people alive so big business gets into it and they need to collect it. It's dangerous. So what are they going to do? They're going to send in prisoners to do it. Um, and the prisoners think they're going to get off, you know, off some time off their sentences. But what they don't realize is that very few people get out of this ship with their mind intact. Um, and then to make matters worse, pirates attack the ship and it starts to sink. So, so yeah, it came from that. And we, we pitched it around to a few people. Um, and we had some interest, but IDW, you know, when 
IDW um, was getting to the point when they lost their license um, for Star Wars. You know, they they said, we want to still work with you guys. Have you got anything? And we said, well, as it happens, yes. And we'd, we'd come up with this six page um, sample, which is on my newsletter somewhere, um, and sent that to them. Um, and it went from there, really. So yeah, and it's a, we completed, so it's six, six issues. We completed it um, earlier on this year. It's just come out as a trade paperback, a collected edition. And now we're looking at other stories that we can tell, not sequels in any way to Dead Seas, but other stories that we could tell the sort of fit, the kind of storytelling we, we, we like to, to work on together. So yeah, it's a, hopefully going to be a partnership that's going to run and run. Uh, Mar- absolutely. It sounds deliciously anxiety inducing. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Oh, that's what a great uh, collaboration there. Uh, uh, so this isn't really a question so much as me just sharing how much I really enjoy seeing you tease Charles Soule at conventions and on panels. <laughs> wow, is that fun? Uh, well, you know, um, it's, he just makes it so easy. I mean, yeah, the thing is, that Charles, I don't think I would have done it in the first days when I met Charles, but as I got to know him, you know, it's like Charles has a very, very dry sense of humor. Um, and I think people, and I think when I first met him, I didn't really get that that sense of humor. He's got a very British sense of humor, in fact, and I think that's because he has spent time here and he had family who live here and he, he again, he gets it. Again, I said I wouldn't mention it by the way, Charles Soule, massive Doctor Who fan, uh, but keeps it very quiet. Um, and and yeah, so as soon as I started to realize, well, hang on a minute, he's, he's joking about a lot of this stuff. Um, and I, he has a persona that he likes to portray at panels, at, you know, at conventions within Star Wars. A lot of it's true, but a lot of it is is put on, you know. Um, and so when I, as soon as I realized that, I thought I can start needling this, and um, <laughs> and I sort of did it at a panel once, and um, it got a massive laugh, and I was like. I'm like, am I going too far here? Um, and he responded, and so it's it beca- it's become a thing that we we sort of have fallen into. Um, and yeah, it's a lot of fun. And he can trust me; he can poke it poke it back the same way. You know, he can give as good as he gets. That boy, um, I'm seeing him in a couple of days um, just after Thanksgiving, and I'm really looking forward to it. But um, yeah, it's um, it's a lot of fun. I'm I'm telling you, uh, friends, if you're at a convention and you know these two are going to be on a panel together, get the popcorn, get there hours in advance. It is worth it to see. Plus, <laughs> sometimes I know what you mean about the dry humor, because uh, I I've only had Gerald's on once, so we haven't talked too much. But he comes across as very very stoic. But there are times when you're saying certain things and you see that little twinkle in his eye, of like mm. he thinks this is hilarious, and it's 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 like a masterclass in comedy, really. So kudos. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he will be the first person to tell you he's a master of everything. So, yeah. <laughs> there you go. I'll insert a little rim shot uh, in post. <laughs> Listening to Coffee with Kenobi, you are with Dan Z, the podcast you're looking for. This is. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, such a pleasure, Kevin. I'm really so delighted uh, to have struck up a friendship with you and, and had you back on the show. Uh, you've got so much going on. What can mm. you? What can we look forward to from you in the future that you are actually able to share? But that's the problem. I can't really share much more other than High Republic at the minute because that is, as far as everyone knows, where it's going for the next few years. And it is um, within the High Republic. I. I'm working on a couple of things that haven't been announced um, yet for phase three. Um, I've, let's see what there is. So I recently had my first episode of Young Jedi Adventures. Which was delightful. Uh, thank you. Um, and there's there's going to be more animation work from me. Um, that's something I've been doing uh, uh, um, alongside my sort of Star Wars work. Um, but these things take so long, <laughs> you know, so it's, some, you know, things that I've been working into, uh, working on. It's um, it's a, it's a, I love animation. I, I, it's always been a dream of mine, and so I've been able to fulfill a bit of that dream in, in small ways and in increasing ways over the last um, couple of years. Um, so there will be more of that, um, not necessarily Young Jedi Adventures, but more animation in general. Um, and then, yeah, I have a another original book, the one I, I'm ta- I, I was talking about today. That's coming from Vault Comics next um, next fall. Um, and I think, other than that, that's all I can talk about. 
and it's really frustrating <laughs> because there is so much I want to say. <laughs> what a wonderful problem to have. Well, Kevin, yeah. thank you so much. I hope you and your family have a, a wonderful holiday. And I, I very much look forward uh, to the next time we can share a pint together. That would be lovely. Thank you. I look forward to it. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. There's no one here.